beat the Darren Roman, I beat the Darren Turk. Defeated Nero's army with 30 minutes work. I fought the greatest leaders and licked them ever one. That is about the biggest thing that man had ever done. From reading those Greek and Latin authors, men from their childhood have acquired a habit under the false slogan of liberty of favouring uproars, lawlessly controlling the actions of their sovereigns and then controlling those controllers with so much blood being spilt that I think I can only truly say, says Hobbes, that the price these Western lands have paid for learning Greek and Latin is the highest that anyone has ever paid for anything. I would actually put it the other way round with Thomas Jefferson. He got the idea of the pursuit of happiness from Aristotle and in Notes on the State of Virginia, 1782, he defined the one real goal of education as equipping people to defend their freedom. And history, he argues, is the subject which can make citizens so equipped. To stay free also requires comparison of constitutions, fearlessness about change, critical lateral and relativist thinking, advanced epistemological skills in source criticism, and the ability to argue cogently. Whom else would we go to but the Greeks? So it beggars belief that it's so difficult to get access to Greek minds in our schools. Half a century after excellent qualifications in classical civilization were first implemented in British schools and colleges of further education. That's a list of all the boards that had exams in them in 1975. If you're one of the 7% of children who is uh, privately educated, of course, the situation is radically different. You'll probably be offered ancient history and or classical civilization, as well as Latin and often ancient Greek at your school. Greek is now a pedagogical marker of the elite caste. A Greek A-level, a grade A or even B, can be purchased with relative ease by rote learning and solicitous teaching at a fee-paying school. It's done so by about 200 people a year. The last full, uh, fully verified figures I've got are for 2010, when it was something over 200 uh, people did ancient Greek A-level, of whom precisely one was at a comprehensive school. Greek A-level provides a teenager with a better chance of getting a place at Oxbridge than to read any other degree. Between 2012 and 2014, for Classics Course 1 at Oxford, 51 classic students were accepted from the state sector and 257 from the non-state. Only one in six came from a state school. There is nothing like such a high percentage of privately educated students in any other subject. There is nothing like so high a chance of admission at 45% or so. In subjects like English and history, chances are never better than one in four and also show, show a very much greater proportion of state school acceptees. Classical applicants have a similar chance of getting into Cambridge at 45%, but actually a slightly better ratio of state sector absentees created solely by their four-year course with a preparatory crash year, which brings in 18 extra state school students. To me, as a Greek scholar, this is just embarrassing. I don't want Greek to function as a mark of money or a queue-jumping ticket to privilege. I do want Greek ideas to expand the minds of all our citizens. So if we want to eradicate the dreadful schism in British classics, what is to be done? What I think is the following. First, we need to praise classical civilization qualifications, campaign for their introduction in every school. This means expanding the number of teachers trained to teach it, encouraging qualified teachers of other humanities to add it to their repertoire. Secondly, Oxford and Cambridge, with their fame and brand, need to lead by example in providing degree courses which do not repel state sector students attracted to classics by reading literature in translation. This means degree courses which engage with literary texts fearlessly in translation as well as history and material culture. <coughs> and secondly, raising the proportion of critical thinking to language acquisition. Undergraduate degrees are supposed to produce competent citizens Traditional classics courses are not making the most of the pearls on their curriculum, which enhance civic as opposed to syntactical competence. There is, however, a serious obstacle to such citizen-friendly proposals. 
It's posed by the pervasive contempt directed from some echelons of the classics community against GCSEs and A-levels in classical civilization. There are classic scholars and alumni, sadly, who happily maintain the exclusive private school Oxbridge monopoly on the Greeks. Almost all the energy currently expended by supposedly classics-friendly charities on supporting a classical presence in the state system is directed towards the teaching of Latin. Now, of course, I have no objection to the teaching of Latin whatsoever. But the exclusive focus on Latin brings with it three possible dangers. First, plenty of meritorious and brilliant young people don't enjoy grammar and are put off the ancient world forever by being offered a diet over heavy on language when they might be thrilled at and incredibly brilliant at explaining other aspects of antiquity. Second, omitting the broader, more conceptually stretching study of the ancient world and of the Greeks implicitly suggests that Latin is more important than Greek or has a prior claim on our citizens' attentions, which is just daft. Third, it actively encourages classical Luddites, those who would rather destroy the modern study of the ancient world than see any overhaul of pedagogical tradition, to disparage classical civilization publicly even. One prominent Oxford-trained journalist very recently described classical civilization in The Telegraph as intellectual baby food with which stu students are spoon-fed and as classics light. This was to insult the entire community of state sector classicists, anyone who's ever read an ancient author in translation. He and his associates have forgotten Gilbert Murray's injunction that it's the Greeks, not Greek, which are the true object of the humanist curriculum. They've forgotten Milton. Milton wrote in his treatise of education that language study is but the instrument conveying to us things useful to be known. And though a linguist should pride himself to have all the tongues that Babel cleft the world into, yet if he hath not studied the solid things in them, as well as the words and lexicons, he were nothing so much to be esteemed as a learned man as any yeoman or tradesman competently wise in his mother dialect only. Thomas Jefferson, by the way, said exactly the opposite to the telegraph snob. He proposed the impressionable minds of the ablest younger children, including the poor he insisted should be funded by the state, could be kept safely occupied with rote learning of uh, irregular verbs until they acquired sufficient intellectual robustness in mid-adolescence to cope with argumentation. That is, Jefferson saw language learning as the intellectual baby food. It's in this context that Professor Pelling and I, along with Professor Paul Cartledge and others, several whom, of whom are here today, hope to launch a new initiative to provide advocacy and support for engagement with the ancient world through classical civilization in schools, universities and other public arenas. In line with our understanding of the goal of education and humanities, it's entitled Classics or Citizenship. Meanwhile, we can excavate the past of Greek to provide a backstory for our advocacy, and that's what I've been doing with Dr. Henry Stead in our AHLC funded project, Classics and Class in Britain. I beat the dare in Roman, I beat the dare in Turk, defeated Nero's army with 30 minutes' work. I fought the greatest leaders and licked them, everyone. That's about the biggest thing.